of Rio Grande do Sul. Marcia has several prizes, you know, for example, the L'Oreal Prize, and the, she's a member of the Academy of, uh, of Science of Brazil, an interna the international one, too. She's also an actress. She does a theater, and uh, you know, we <laughs> besides both. We both. besides physics, she does uh, this type of things too. And so today she's going to talk about water, which is uh, she's an, an expert in this field. Thank you, Carla. Ah, okay, Marcia, you have to put that. Fine. Yeah. You will be registered. Okay. And uh, this thing follows you while you walk. Okay. okay. <laughs> I do love water, and the reason why I do love water is because it's a disregarded material. Everybody thinks, ah, so common. What's the interesting you have to do about water? And I start with this picture. It's not a cartoon. It's a real photograph taken in Patagonia, not for me because I hate cold weather. But in any case, this picture was taken, and it shows water in plain sight, in liquid, solid, and if you have good eyes, you are going to see some water vapor. So you can have all the states without needing to expand a fortune. But before talking what I'm going to tell you about water, let me introduce my extended group in which we study from water to cold atoms to society to gender, everything, OK? So what's the problem I would like to share with you today? The problem is that some people have taken uh, carbon nanotubes, real carbon nanotubes, and they put water inside the nanotubes, and they flow water inside the carbon nanotubes. And they did many sizes of nanotubes, and you see here from 1.6 nanometer to 0.8 nanometers. And as you do that, they measure that the ratio between the uh, velocity you have in the experiment and the velocity would have if the hydrodynamic equations that rules the water in the sink of your house give this difference. So the puzzle is that you have an increase as you do that in the carbon nanotubes, then go down and increase. And look to the numbers. It's as if I give you all the sizes and the pressures of the use in the experiments and you use hydrodynamics and the ratio between reality and your calculations is 900. I don't know in your university, but in my classroom, if someone gives an answer with 900 of difference is zero, OK, in the exam. So we have to understand what is going on there. And it's not, this happens with other materials, but not with this size of difference. So, but Marcia, why do you care about that? What's the relevance of understanding water flowing fast in carbon nanotubes? And the reason why I'm looking for water is that even though it's this common material, if you take all the water of the planet put in this big tank, oh, Nestlé is smiling about having that. Anyway, if you have this big tank, most of the water in this big tank is salty water. And if you take this little part, 2.5% of the water of the planet, most is frozen or underground, and you're living with this. And if you don't, you think that even this amount is enough, you, UNESCO don't agree with you. And UN don't agree with you. When they paint the planet in 1950, more blue means you have more water than you need. More uh, red and reddish means you don't have enough water. You have less water than you need for living. Pay attention that Europe already in 1950 didn't have enough water for their living because they eat the, the, the food we produce. If you go to 90, 1995, you can see that unlikely the politics, the world is getting more red uh, and more and more. And the prediction for three, three years from now is that half of the planet will be living in region with stress water. So we need to develop new ways to get more fresh water. Otherwise, we are going to be lacking the requirement. Don't, don't think, do not take a, a bath from now on because you want to, to economize water, because it's not in the bath that you expend more water. We expend more water in producing and producing in an inefficient way food. So if you want to contribute, dieting. 
is the reason for that. Anyway, we can look for how can we solve this problem in how this problem have been solved uh, until now. So people have thinking about desalination. Desalination means you take the, the salty water that can be black sea water or the sea water and you pass to a filter. Unfortunately, due to osmosis, this process is very expensive. It's very expensive to do that and this is the size of a desalination plant. Many, many countries in the planet cannot afford to have a desalination plant of this size because of the energy cost. So we have to think about other ways to do the same job in a more efficient way. And that's the challenge I put myself, reserve the question about the nano, the nano tube, because we are going to go back to this point. So the point my group raises is that water have more than 70 behaviors in which water does everything different than the other materials. However, when they build the desalination plants, they do not use a single one of the water anomalies. So they're not using the treasure that are the water anomalies. Let me explain to you a few of these water anomalies. This is strange things water does. So this is the specific heat of water. And you see that the specific heat against temperature have this funny U form. If you take any other material, like here's methanol, you're going to see that it always increase with the temperature. So we see two effects here in water. The first effect is that this funny increase when it decreases the temperature. And the second thing is that the specific heat of water is large. It means that I have to give a lot of I have to really give a lot of heat to temperature to increase a little bit the temperature. A lot of heat to increase the temperature. That's a good thing for water. We are made of water. It's good that we, you know, we really need to get a lot of heat to increase our temperature, but it's also good for the planet. Imagine an ocean that you would have made of methanol with a smaller specific heat. So we, with a little heat, you fluctuate the temperature, we are going to have waves of size of different flow of heat that you make very stable, more stable than we have now the weather. Another property that's very funny is the compressibility, it means the response when you do this in a material. In this case, again, you see this U shape, and you see that now the compressibility when you compare water with toluene, the compressibility of water is very small. It's not like a solid, okay, not zero, but this is small. What it means that water has this tendency of behaving like a pack, a bunch, a bunch moving. Also important because the low compressibility of water is the thing that makes possible for us to have land. If you, water would be a very standard, would cover most of the land we have. So it's a, again a good thing. And the more famous is the thermal expansion. Most material, when you compare the thermal expansion with temperature, it's boring. It's boring, like it's a flat line like that. But water not only is not boring, change sign. What means that the density have a maximum density? What means that in the normal materials, when you decrease the temperature, the materials you do like we do in the winter time, you get more and more and more like that. But what do you do something different? What do you do like that? And then you decrease temperature is going to expand. And this is a fundamental phenomenon and the key to understanding all the 70 anomalies of water. And it is key because thanks to that, when you freeze, you are going to have four, four centigrade water at the bottom. With that, we keep life. And that's a very important thing, not for us in Brazil, because we don't have anything freezing, so we don't care that you know, even you don't even have four centigrade. But when you have the frozen times, you have this, the, the solid part on the top only because this phenomenon. And you can see that it's a very tiny, this is a data, data point, that's a very tiny phenomenon. It's not a huge number, but it's enough to make this a strong difference. And when you look for life in other planets, and satellites, we look for eyes because we have the expectation that at some point in their history of that planet, we would have 
liquid water, and maybe at the very bottom we can still find some water. But maybe my favorite, you know, within the 70, I promise I'm not going to talk about the 70 anomalies, but I'm going to talk about this one that's my favorite one, that have to be about G fusion. Most liquids, what they you do? If you take, you compress them, you compress them, then you have the diffusion that go up, 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 up. You always increase when you decompress them. What happens region in which you increase the pressure and they increase the diffusion, increase the pressure, increase the, increase the pressure. And you can see here this, this circles, they are illustrating the maximum of density. That's a kind of neighbor of the maximum of the diffusion. Those are experimental points, and we need to understand that. Okay, so let's try to convey an idea that will not be microscopically, but will be mesoscopically about why water does all those crazy things. And here are our major star, our oxygens, our hydrogens, and the main thing, we start with the thing that's the shape. Water only have all these anomalies because you have this V shape. Okay? And the shapes is thanks to the fact that you have to complete the last, the oxygen needs to complete, you know, the electron and needs two hydrogens. And because they, they have all these electrons, they form a tetrahedral structure within the electrons, and that gives this V shape. But it's a very particular V shape because oxygens have much more protons than hydrogens. So they push all the electrons to the oxygen, and thanks to the V shapes, plus the fact that the oxygen is pushing all the electrons, you get a polarization. And the polarization creates uh, dipole moments that leads to the hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonds, because they have this nature, dipolar nature, they are kind of picky. They don't like to be far apart. It's like you seeing a dipole. If you're really far from here, they two are a dipole. I can almost see them out my glasses as one particle, okay? So far apart didn't work. We need to have a certain distance to see the dipole. And if you come too close, you only see one part. So the hydrogen bond will only be formed if a specific angle and distance. But once it's formed, your liquid water, your glass of water is all the time forming in this form. It's, it's like a dance, like the dance we are going to see tonight in the samba, but so it's like a dance. You have green here represents the hydrogen bonds, so they are tetrahedrals forming hydrogen bonds here. Then you compress the system and they break the bonds. That's the reason why when you decrease the temperature, you want to make all the hydrogen bonds, the particles that are really close like that, they do that. So. Basically, what I'm trying to say to you that I can imagine all these anomalies only looking to this dance that is from this configuration to the disconfiguration, this is known to be the two states of water. So we are simplifying the many phases you form as a solid with these two. Bounded, not bounded, bounded, not bounded, like a dance. Okay, let's look to this picture now and try to explain the anomalies I just mentioned to you with my fingertips. So when I look the, for far apart, the liquid water, you're going to see that they have the tendency of locally forming this structure that you call the tremors. But the tremors will be disconnected. So from far away, you'll be very, very entropic system. So the specific heat that is fluctuation of entropy, my local entropy minus the total entropy, I mean, as I form the tremors, this is the increase. And this explains why you have this increase here, forming more and more tetramers. The same explanation helps to the compressibility. As you have local that have more volume than the average, you increase the compressibility. And the uh, thermal expansion coefficient is the, the cross of these two fluctuations in which this is negative and this explains why it becomes negative. Okay, but we don't do science only with my fingers, so I try to understand the other phenomena, the fact that you have an increase in diffusion as you increase the density, looking at molecular dynamic simulations for a specific model of water. You have a whole family of models, but in all the models this will appear. And you observe exactly like the increase of density makes an increase in my 
diffusion. And then I remember the first time I showed that, I always show my things to my parents. I showed that to my parents, and I thought, wow, there's this experiment. I could see the same thing as the experiments. And naively, my father said, but if the experiments are already saw, what did you find of new? Okay? My family is very positive for my work. They are very supportive. But they, I had an answer for that. And they answered that with the simulations, I could do something different than experiments. I put an arrow in my oxygen, and I could see the molecule to rotate. Remember, the, the water wants to make the tetramer. So if you move fast, you also have to accommodate like in a dance. And we found that when you do this dancing, the place in which you have the minimum in the diffusion, you have the longest time to rotate. Like water is moving, when it's moving slow, it's doing slow, and when it's moving fast, it's doing fast. Okay? So there's a correlation between these two things. And actually, it's more interesting than we have imagined because uh, sometime later, the, the Stellan's group move, proved that the particles that move faster are actually the neighbors of the one rotating. So we walk like that, and the one around you are rotating like this kind of old films in which the pretty lady goes like that, and the guy's going rotating. Or the evanescence, call me when you're sober, have a picture that resembles that. But we could learn something even more deep in the process that the fact that water moves fast and they rotate fast have to do with the hydrogen bonds. The problem is that water form four hydrogen bonds. And if you look in the simulations, they are forming four hydrogen bonds. But how the density increase? You know, we need an increase in density with four neighbors. But we observe something very fascinating. As you have the density increase, we have a percentage of water having more than four neighbors, okay? So we are, the water is walking and it can go fast because all the time it's forming hydrogen bonds because the next neighbor is so close that water can do something like that. To, 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 you understand? All the time having the, the four neighbors and moving fast. And we call that internally in the group, something that the opponents do not understand, a fait to Ricardo. It's moving, and it's moving, but have more than four neighbors, okay? So I was convinced that these two states is a powerful thing, that you have water all the time passing from one neighbor to another neighbor, so we decided to design a model in which you don't have water, we only have the two states, competing states, and you generate this two length scale model, one, forget hydrogens, for that oxygen, you just have the two length scales. A potential like this blue one, with long length scale, not connected, lower energy for the connected, and we, we show that we can show the density, diffusion, specific heat, all the bunch of the anomalies of water using two states model. So water is behaving in a much more simple way. And you're going to ask me, Marta, what does this have to do with the carbon nanotube and the water flowing fast? Well, have to do because we decide to push our idea of a two states model a little bit further than analyzing bulk water. We decided to look to the confinement systems using this same idea. So we are going to have two reservoirs. We are going to have the two reservoirs connected by a nanoscale, a nanotube, and we are going to make our water to flow. Here we are going first to only look diffusion. So we are going to keep the concentration in the two sides of my reservoir the same, so water is just doing that without flow, yet not flowing. And when you do that, what people have shown for real water, not for our tooling scales, is that we have a decrease in the diffusion and then an increase again. You understand? You're doing that, and as you do that, particles start to be slower, but when you really squeeze them, they start to be crazy, okay? And we did that with the reservoirs as our potential, and you observe exactly the same behavior. You have this, water freezes here, freezes at ambient temperature inside, 
uh, the nanotube. This should be a video for some reason it's not showing. Okay. No, it's not shown for some reason. But anyway, the particle is just doing, uh, now it's shown, okay? So the particles, as you see, they are squeezed, but they form. It is sphere represent not a single water molecule, but a tetramer. Remember the tetramer, the four ones that get together? So this represents the tetramer, and you could understand, because if you put the full water, I do a simulation, all the water, you don't see the single line doing that. You see the particles are one, no, one is not passing, through the order, they are just doing something like that. And they are doing something like that, meaning that the tetramer, they stay in the same, in the same place. Go back, I, I promise, I'm coming back to the problem in which you have the flow. And you can do the same thing, but now you have the flow. And when you look to the flow, remember that the, the experiment have this funny kink go up uh, again. So what you observe is that as we squeeze the nanotube, what happens is that water starts to form layers, like an onion. So you have to have a layer close to the wall, another layer, and then you move in these layers, unlike the water in our sink, and then you form these layers of water. Here are the terms of water, actually. And the kink happens when you pass from two layers to a single layer. And the single layer, we show later, is stressless. It's so far from the wall that we don't have this contact stress, and that's the reason why it flows so fast. It's a way, because it's hydrophobic, it's forming a single line. It's like we going hand by hand and forming a single line to walk faster. So that's the mechanism behind that. And that's just the, uh, the, the simulation. And why that seems to be so appealing and attractive is because if I can improve something in the desalination process is the membrane permeability. The membrane permeabilities nowadays are not good. They are too rough. And one idea is to make membranes made of nanocarbon nanotubes of course, thousands and thousands of them, but carbon nanotubes because water will flow very fast and salt is not going to enter to the nanotubes because they are too small and the salt have to give up the hydration shell to enter inside the tube. And that's a very energy costly due to the high dielectric discontinuity between water in the reservoir and, and water in the nanotube. That is the, of course, there are many questions in designing that. One question is, what would be the chirality, the favor chirality for the nanotubes to give the best flow? I just show one chirality, that's the armchair, but we also have zigzag, have many chirities. And we show that, in fact, the chirality matters very little when you are in this region of big diffusion or the region for the large size, the only difference in the chirality is in the region of frozen. Because there's a point in the diffusion in which water will froze inside the nanotube, and this really depends on the structure that's correlating between the wall and the nanotube. Marcia, please, can you come back and say again what means chirality in this Chirality in this means picture? look to the tube to design of the tube. Water, when, when real water, now I have to give up my model because I need the real water to, to fit in this. Uh, real wa when water ends in a tube that have this type of structure or this type of structure, they you be organized inside the tube in a different way. This kind of illustrate that. That is the zigzag, zigzag is this one. The name is kind of self-explaining. But what, what, what colors it, mean? What colors mean? Color means more oxygen. Ah, okay. okay. So when you look in front, you look like that to the tube. You are going to see in the armchair this is all organized like that. But that doesn't mean that they are forming circles like that. They are forming a helix, and because they forming a helix, when you look to the front, you are going to see this 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 organization like that. Okay. And this means that they are moving in lines, 
You see, you see that there is in, in the zigzag, they are more uh, line up. And that's why it's so difficult for free having the frozen part, okay? So, but the main message is that once you arrive to the single line, okay, this is still when they are forming two lines, you know, when they form a single line, that's this structure, the difference is zero. Okay, when they are one line, the difference is known. It's, it's important when they freeze because the arm share is not going to be able to freeze inside. Okay? But as you can see, if I think about doing something as a membrane, I have to be very careful in the size I'm designing because if I design the size, I'm going to have water stuck. So it's, it's not an easy challenge. We have to produce all the nanotubes with the same size and no impurities, and it is, it is a challenge. I already asked some of my colleagues that work Pimenta, please make a million of nanotubes, all of them with this diameter. He left for an hour, and they said, I cannot do that in that amount. So it's, just, it's still a feasible thing. And also, if you compress, for instance, you make a mistake, you put in a material, you little bit compress, you have, this is the compression, you have very different behaviors depending on the type of nanotube. So you need to be perfect, you need to have them in a very specific diet. So because this sound to me too difficult, but the phenomena of violating hydrodynamic equations do not depend if it's a nanotube or just a nanopore, we decided to move on to study the same phenomena, but now in nanopores. Because the pores are more easily to be fabricated. We already are able to produce graphene in large amounts, so just need to make nanopores in the graphene. And because I want to study that with salt, we need to do something else before doing that. We need to develop reliable models for water and for salt. Most of the models in the literature, they don't care about dielectric constant. They care about many other things that are very important, density, etc. But we need to focus in dielectric constant because I want to understand the system when salt is present. So you develop a model for water, they develop a model for salt, and you create a simulation in which on one side you have water and salt. Here, I'm not illustrating the water, just the salt, and you put pressure like you do in a desalination plant, and the water has to pass through a nanopore. Here, we select as a material a disulfate molybdenum because the material have charges, is is neutral but have a charge distribution which we believe would make better for water to pass because we generate an, a dipole. Of course, we are going to say, but also we attract salt, so we have to combine the two things in a very careful way. And we prove that you can have that, but the next question we can make is that when you have the pores and the pores are too close together, we might generate a turbulence effect. You understand, I have water entering in, in one pore, and I don't want to, sec to have a second pore for water to pass that you disturb the single line of my water. So the question here is how close you have to put these two pores in order to keep the same quality of a single pore. Here's the result of when you increase the pressure, and you can see this is a very realistic pressure. When you make a desalination plant, pressure are very high, and the membrane permeability, that's the quantity that measures if the membrane is good or not, and you can see that when I have one pore, I have this type, when I have the two different pores, very little change unless you have very high pressures. Then you start to have small turbulence, in fact. And why one power is different from the two pores? Because they are one, you know, compared to two, so let's renormalize so everybody gets the same right. I divided the two pores by two, and you can see that the difference really arises when I, I'm working in very high pressures. So I can afford to put the pores very close together because this alignment, remember I mentioned to you, will not affect uh, the passing through of water. This is not true when I have a usually membrane. A usual membrane, having the two pores close together, generates turbulence effect. But here, because water already knows that it's going to enter into a nanopore, it gets organized before the entrance, forming the single line, 
uh, of water particles. And here is the, the salt rejection that you can see that for smaller pressure, then you have a little bit of loss, and that's, that's much better than the usually rejection of a normal membrane. Of course, those membranes do not exist. They require uh, being able to uh, build up disulfate molybdenum growing not in silica, where usually they grow molybdenum sulfate, but in a, in a plastic that would be a polymer that would be completely transparent to water. People in the world try attempting to do that. And why they are attempting to do that? Because if you were able to build this type of rejection, this type of permeability, we will be able to reduce that size of a desalination plant to one-tenth. So it will be one-tenth of the size to produce the same thing because they are so large because you need to pass water and then the same water pass again and the same water pass again. And here, the rejection is quite hard. To understand how water pass, here I'm illustrating against more red, more yellow means more oxygens. And you see that for different size, the water gets organized in very different way, different from the carbon nanotubes. Water in here, I'm changing two things. I'm changing the, 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 the diameter, and I'm doing another game. Remember that I mentioned to you that the disulfate molybdenum have charts, have one double charge in the molybdenum and, and two plus in each sulfur. And I decided to play nature, so I create a disulfate molybdenum with no charge, the normal charge, and double the charge, just because then I can explore different materials with the same uh, symmetry. And you can see that the, 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 when you compare roughly for the same size, this, the distribution of water is very much impacted by the charge because of the di dipoles. That would be expected. But the question you want to, to make is, is uh, how this, this distribution of charge, you know, when you go to more single line is better. So this makes a win-win a, a, a in this one because from the single line. You're always looking to the single line. Well, if I can make a single line, which is a small size, what about I pile membranes and make a tube? Maybe a tube of pile membranes that are feasible will be a plus C. So we decided to do that. That's my pile of membranes, and I have one tube, one, one pore on top of the other forming a tube. Unfortunately, when you do that with real materials, what happens is that in the connection, because we have the real atoms, in the connection, there is no way you cannot have a space. So what do you do? You do like that. You enter the first part, a line, but then you see this things going. You do thing, and that you make stress. So it's doing something like this, and it gets stressed when you do like that. So that was unfortunately not a good idea. What would be easier to do, more resist, but was not a good idea. And you show that when you increase the number of layers, you change the, per, the, the permeability of the system. Here, just to illustrate when you renormalize. And this is just to show that when you have the enhancement flow, we still have that uh, similar for three and six layers, but unfortunately, not for the one layer. But, well, but up to now, I only give you solutions that require the ocean, OK? Give me the ocean, I can give you fresh water. Suppose I live in the desert. Suppose I live in the inner part of Brazil, where you have lack of fresh water. What can I do now, OK? So one idea comes from nature. That's a bug that lives in the Namibia desert. What this bug does? These bugs have in the top of the back some sticks in which in the top of the stick have a very hydrophilic material that transforms water vapor into liquid water, then comes to a hydrophobic that collects, and the animal you drink is drinking this water. So in the desert, we have this change of temperature from 
uh, night to the morning that generates hot vapor that allows the animal to do that. Many plants, Cotula phallax is a plant that does the same. So many plants in the desert does actually the same uh, thing. So what you thought in doing, we designed a nanocone bug, okay, that you do basically the same thing that the bug, but now in, in, in a cone format. So we're going to have uh, a cone in which you're going to put in the surface, larger surface of the cone, a very hydrophilic material. In the middle, another hydrophilic material. In the back, another hydrophilic, and a hydrophilic collector. Why I do not paint the whole cone? First, why not use a tube? Remember, the tube was the one doing the single line. Because if I put hydrophilic things in the single line, what will be so comfortable that you're going to stay there is you're going to have difficulty of flowing. So we decided to put this cone for not because we attract water here and then you push to the second layer and push to the last layer. So the cone have this idea behind that. So what you observe in our simulations? First, you have to look to this blue part as a big cloud. So we have a reservoir of water that you be heated in this heated like would be a cloud. This generate a vapor. If you think that generating a vapor is an easy, easy task, I challenge you to do that. If you put in a box particle, it will bring to the vapor, attempt to the bring to the vapor side, you are going to phase separate all the time. That's something we don't want it. So we need to generate this cloud. It's a lot of computational time wasted, but we have to do that. Then you generate this water vapor. Then you have the surface that's a collector, and you form droplets in the surface, and the droplets will be attracted to the hydrophilic, and then you enter to the system. This should be a simulation. Um, let's see if I can. Ah, go. And you see, you form the vapor, the vapor get attached, form droplets, the droplets are attracted, to the surface, and they enter. I don't have pressure. Only, you know, the pressure of the air. I'm not pushing them to the, the cone. I'm but not moving them to the cone. You must but uh, a quick question. Uh, uh, what's the mechanism for, for the water to go from one layer to the next, for instance, if there is no pressure? Uh, they go because you generate. The, the thing I didn't mention, is that I have here a gradient in temperature. So the gradient provokes the, the vapor, and the fact that this layer is hydrophilic attracts the vapor. So it's like you have a big rainy cloud, and you have this change in temperature, and more heat here. Here the heat, the temperature is fixed. The temperature here is all fixed. But here you have a gradient of, of temperature generating the vapor. Once you form the water vapor, they disconnect, they, they, they break the hydrogen bonds, and they are looking for the layer, because the layer have two things, two effects. They are hydrophilic, so they attract, but also they allow for lower energy to form hydrogen bonds. Yeah. Okay, so there's a tendency in layers, even if they are not completely hydrophilic, to form hydrogen bonds, because they, they, they generate the space for that, the space for that. So then the droplets will move, because this entrance is very hydrophilic, the drops will move here, and then you go to the other side, okay? The system is already pretty much under study, but we observe there is a dynamics in each initial time in which the drops are formed. Then there is this flow. We start collecting more and more and more as droplets form. And here is because in the other side of the simulations, we just have one single layer. When the single layer is full of water, we have to stop the simulations. And of course, we have to change that, but this is very long simulation, so to have a bigger box, we need a bigger box for that. Here is to show that the dynamics is during the time in which we collect, it's very, it's, you know, very equilibrated the dynamics. It, you can collect it all the time. And the dynamics that we didn't understand completely yet is that the droplet, it seems that once the droplets form inside the nano, the nano cone, they try to move as a droplet. So we might have to calculate surface tension, et cetera, of this droplet. 
And this is, again, the picture of the dynamics showing that you form this drop, and the drop moves and form a huge drop, and it keeps on moving like a drop. And, but there is a trick, is that this hydrophilic, they cannot be too low, so have to be really hydrophilic, but not too much. So if you increase the strain of the hydrophilicity, make too hydrophilic, the water will be so comfortable inside the cone that's not going to move. So there is a trick. And if you ask, I don't know the material yet because we generate an artificial material only tuning the interaction with water by hand. That's the good thing of doing simulations. Being a theoretical person, you can create things that do not exist in nature. But we, are, we have parts of our group that is studying different materials in order to understand which real material could be that that you doped the graphene in order to make this con. Conclusions. So I hope you now don't think that water is a simple system. We know everything about water. That if you go nano and use this craziness of water, particularly at nanoscale, you might be able to do uh, things. And I might say that in this particular type of systems, everything matters. The size, the shape, the charge. So one thing we are doing now is to using uh, artificial intelligence to be able to explore a huge number of size and shapes and charges of materials to find the perfect nanopore uh, for uh, the perfect water model. As two perfects, here you have to have the perfect models for the materials and the perfect bottom. I might not finish without shaking you about something that obviously in this school is very important. That's the fact that if you do science, you have to do a science in which you, you have diversity. And that's not a joke. I've been in an event at the ICTP in which we discuss water prospection in Africa. And there are most, the majority of them were men. And they all tell the stories that the women in their house are responsible to bring water to the house, but they are not involved in the planning of getting more water. Uh, I would like to finalize, sorry for the foreigners, the message that goes now is not for you. Sorry, sorry. It's just for the Brazilians. We are living in a moment in which much, many of us are kind of depressed, you know, beaten, like oh, difficult, You're, you know, heavy with all this situation. I'm, I think I'm the older person in the room. And I came from a time in which you have a dictatorship in this country, many years. But you fought, and you got it. And you have a democracy thanks to that. Because together we can. Thank you very much. So, uh, thanks, Professor Marcia, for the nice lecture. I have two quick questions. The first one is like, uh, uh, it's like if a child would ask you this, but what is the difficulty of synthesizing water in the lab? Because we know the energy associated with the bonds. How can, what is the difficulty? What can we uh, overcome to do this? Because this could be a way of, I don't know, solving the problem with water. And the second question is regarding the experimentally, how to measure the thermal expansion of water. I don't do the, let's start with the last one. I don't do uh, the, the experiments, but most of the time what you can do uh, is to do the density. Because then you do the density and the density is related to the thermal expansion. Okay, that's the, what, the easiest way to do that and the easiest way to, to show. Yeah, and this we can do with a lot of procedure. I might say it very much depends on the pressure. So we have to guarantee that your pressure I don't know if I show the different pressures. Now it got stuck. Each time I have a video, it got stuck. But if you change the pressure, the, the profile of the density is going to, to change. Okay, so we start with the density. The difficult is it's the energy. You have to find, a, a synthesize something. You have to, to the, the result you get, 
have to be something that you didn't spend a lot of energy. That's the, the game. And it's a lot of energy to, to synthesize. We still have, when you still have some water available around us. Even when I mentioned to take, remove salt from water, that is, is a very expensive, but there are places, even in Brazil, we have in, in Fernando de Noronha, you have a desalination plant. In California, you find this, you find in the Middle East. It still is, is less expensive than, than doing the experiment in the lab. Mm -hmm. Professor Marcia, I would like to know if uh, turbulence has some role on the desalination process. Turbulence, the phenomenon of turbulence and the water flux. Uh, this phenomenon could um, affect the desalination problem or the flux and the tub or the diffusion water coefficient, something like that. Uh, let's start with the real, the process we are doing today in the real desalination plant. The process in the real desalination plant is not like I show in the picture like you, you are you're filtering a coffee. It's different. The water passes in the tube, and since the pressure is like that, the filter is the part that is around the tube. Okay? So water does that. Because the salt like to be in surface, a lot of salt in this process get attached to the surface. And actually, in this process that's not non-scale, the tur there are tur turbulence process, and the turbulence helps in removing the salt. Okay, so in the real desalination, the one present today, turbulence it's a very good thing. But the process when you go nano is different because we, in order to be very effective, you need to have the single line. So turbulence would be pressure very bad for the for to, to the single line. For the pressures we are using in the simulation, we only observe starting of the, the, the turbulence at a very, very high pressure beyond the ones employed today in the, in the desalination. So we are safe in this, this system. And why we are safe? Because when you go to the tube, close, I didn't show the, the, the potential, but it's very interesting that when you have the layer here, you have the hole here, before the hole, because of the hydrogen bond network, the hydrogen bonds want to keep uh, stable, so they are already aligned before entering. And because salt don't want to enter that, because already in the surface they, they are losing water, the salt, the salt tends to be behind. Of course, this is not perfect. You could see if I put a lot of pressure, some salt is going to enter. And when salt will enter, then I start to have this turbulence effect. So I have to avoid any salt close to the surface, being pressures that are OK, and, and to keep this aligned. So no turbulence on the nanoscale? No, in, my, in my simulations, no turbulence. In the real system, yes, turbulence, and they are actually good for that method of making the desalination. Another board question. If you make your water charged, you put the external electric fields, external magnetic fields, I think this will, would out, make a difference on the coefficient of diffusion. Sure. What's going to happen? Could, could you make yeah. any comment there on that? There are groups that are groups studying uh, exactly the effect of putting some electrical field. And, and there are competing effects. The first, you, the double poles of water, you do online even better. But there is a, a problem that you actually move more salt to the membrane surface. That's something we try to avoid. So I, I'm not yet going to this direction because I'm a little bit afraid of having too much salt close to the, the pore entrance. That's something I try to avoid in my, my way of doing. But that's a relevant question. People are doing that. I have a question. OK, yes. Um, did you explore the um, water uh, transport in cells when you were building these systems? Ah, the real, real cells, living yeah. cells. OK. When you have uh, water entering in, in the in the cells, to the channels, you're mentioning the channels, there is a big difference from what we are doing here. And the difference is roughness. 
Some people try to make desalination with you know, copying nature with the, the water channels in, in the cells. But the difference is that there, the, the cells are rough. And because they are rough, they lead to a little bit of more stress with the oil. So we can do the same thing, but you need to put, like we do in our cells, they need to have charges inside the membrane to do the pushing, high charges. And they you, they you move different than a single line. They will make more, more closely to the nanocone. They will do something like that. You understand? One water enters, the water is there, and then you move one, and the water was going. It's more, it, it's, it's another mechanism for that. Okay? But there are people exploring this mechanism because it's much more biological developed, so people think that it would be a, an interesting way to do this, this process. Thank you. Marcia, concerning this, the, the scales of, uh, of having, of, uh, obtaining the, the drinkable water, uh, is this desalination the most, uh, the least expensive process, uh, process that you have in mind today? Or is this type of a mechanism that, uh, what, what do you have in mind to... Okay, desalination uh, is the thing people are using today. In two, I only show the hair versus mozi, but there is distillation also. And they are not, they, they are about to get into the, the thermodynamic limit. They are very close. Mm -hmm. uh, but with their type of membrane. So changing a membrane is the first step if you want to do something that will be at least a smaller scale, at least with smaller energy. But actually, what we have to think, and this is another challenge, I didn't, I attempt to go this way, but it's very difficult, is to rethink the whole engineering process, to think about smaller scales of doing the same thing. And that is the idea, I'm, since this do not exist, you know, taking water from the air is not a technology present, I decided to go this way because then I can design the whole pack, then thinking about how it's going, the size this can be, what the amount, and, and the whole engineering part as well. But we need to explore other types of things. There are other types of things going on in smaller scales, like they have these nets, now, a huge net, like a soccer game net, in which they pan the soccer game net with hydrophilic material, and they collect, and then they collect. So there are a number of things people are thinking, and they always have the scalability problem, the other types of problems that you're going to face. This is not only to collect water for drinking. The idea is also to correct water humidity that is going to appear more and more thanks to the to do, do climate change. So we need to have areas in which you correct humidity, and maybe things like that can allow for that. Okay, so if there, there are no more questions, let's thank Marcia again. Okay, so we, have a we will have one hour and a half uh, uh, break.